What does Tyrese Halliburton's extension truly mean for the Pacers and how it will allow this team to build going forward? Kevin Bowen from 1075, the fan, and I discuss that as well as Bruce Brown, Obi Toppin, the Pacers path forward, and so much more on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today we got Kevin Bowen from 1075 The Fans Morning Show and Colts Content here to talk all things Pacers free agency, a heavy discussion of Tyrese Halbert and his extension today, what it allows the Pacers to do, how it it sets their path forward, what it means for the pace of their build, all sorts of things, as well as some discussion, of course, on Bruce Brown and Obi Toppin and the Pacers cap space next year, which, full alert, could be quite a lot. Lots to get to on today's show. Let's just get right to it. If anything, he should be introducing me. But today, as many of you locally know, it's Kevin Bowen from 1075, the fans morning show. Kevin and Query, as well as covering the Colts for 1075. Kevin this isn't football free agency, but of course, a big one with the Pacers. And we're going to get into a lot of Tyrese Halliburton today, but I would like to let you start by just airing out your thoughts on what the Pacers have done so far. Yeah, I'm a fan of it. And as always, thanks for having me, Tony. You know, I respect the hell out of your work. And this is a must listen for me each and every day. So i um, honored to be on. Yeah, I, I, I'm a fan. I guess I just didn't walk into last week thinking like this home run was going to be smashed over the fence 450 feet. And, you know, maybe Kevin Pritchard at times, you know, is a little bit too candid in those moments to describe, <laughs> oh, we did take these big swings. And that kind of gets everybody's hopes up. And, you know, when you have the amount of resources that they did and still they have a good amount, I understand the reasoning why you would you would think that. But I like Bruce Brown. And honestly, probably the reason I like it the, the most is just if you're going to overpay, which I think is not the proper term to use at all, considering the length of the contract, considering you had to pay something this this offseason. Why not pay for your biggest weakness? And I would argue maybe your two biggest weaknesses, defense being one. And then secondly, isn't winning kind of a weakness right now? I mean, nobody on this team has won when it matters. And, you know, putting that all in one player is probably a bit unfair. But I just don't look at this and think it's Austin Crozier or Timothy Mozgov or, you know, insert your other guys that have made deep playoff runs and then all of a sudden they get paid. I, I think this addresses on the short term um, a very specific need in, in multiple ways. And then with Toppin, I, I've said this before, Tony, on our radio show with the Colts, I always am a fan of kicking the tires on former first-round picks. And when you're in a market like Indiana in the NBA, if you can kick the tires on former lottery picks, I think that fits the bill exactly that. Um, I was referencing earlier today, if you look back on the Colts, they've only made the playoffs twice in the last you know, half dozen years. In both of those seasons, they kicked the tires on former first-round picks, and they were vital to them making the playoffs, Eric Ebron in 2018 and Xavier Rhodes in 2020. So, you know, when you look at the history of that COVID draft in 2020 and how the Pacers have already tapped into it and, yeah. you know, Toppin's floor, even if he's just a high flying athlete that catches, you know, lobs from Tyrese, that's, that, that's worth something. And if he can tap into what he showed you in those two April games last year. And yeah, you know, I went a little deeper into his three point shooting when he's a starter. I want to say it's 43% in the wow. 15 games of, of his starting career. I mean, that's, and this is high volume. It's like four or five threes a game. That's a pretty notable number to me. So we'll see, take a chance on it. See if you find something he's in a contract here. He's hungry. I'm good with it all. So what I just heard you do is belittle Aaron Neesmith and Daniel Tyson's trip to the finals, Kevin Bow, and That's what I heard. You do. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me, let me reference um, meaningful, which I guess Tice might have had a little bit more of a meaningful role, <laughs> meaningful role in somewhat recent playoff appearances. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I, I especially think with Toppin, like I, I've said this too, if you're the lowest on him of anyone, even for that price, you do that, right? You sure. just give it a shot. See what happens. If he just plays 20 consistent minutes a game and splits those minutes with Jarris Walker. Great. That's like exactly why what you want in a team in the Pacers position. And there's a chance that it's just a way better fit and it's perfect. So I cannot agree more on those guys had tons of stuff up on them, but I like getting more feelers out on them. And I think that the part of this reason that you can tell the Pacers did a good job is there's a pretty overwhelming consensus from most that 
They've been successful in getting their needs. And I said this with Derek Schultz over this week. They might have got the second best free agent who actually changed teams. And that says a lot about what they were able to do. I talked a lot about them, though. I want to talk about the biggest thing that they did, and that is spend 260 million bones to keep Tyrese Halliburton in town for a long time. Um, a long time in NBA standards. Six years is forever in NBA standards. You won the title six years ago. Uh, that was the year the first Kevin Durant Warriors title was six years ago. If you would like to know how long ago six years ago was, like that's a long freaking time to have a guy and build around him in NBA terms and TBD on if there's an option on the end of that or not, but that's a great thing for the Pacers to have. And so now I feel like, yeah, obviously this coming season, a lot of the discussion will be about the Pacers trying to win and make the postseason, and they have certainly increased their chances to do so. But to me, a big story of this off season is now the Pacers future, their next free agency, their next trade deadline is all about building around this guy. Right. And so Kevin, to you, how do you feel like, this changes how they approach their future things. And what do you feel like they need to do to properly build around him going forward? Yeah, I just think in general, urgency rises. And, I, you know, the contract probably didn't need to be handed to him for me to have said that. You know, I think anytime as a franchise you go, what is it now, five years without a playoff win? I think it's nine years without a playoff series win. I mean, those are pretty stark numbers, frankly, for any franchise in the league, particularly yeah. one with the reputation that the Pacers have created. For themselves since since their existence so i would say urgency rises but anytime you get to a second contract with your star certainly it's there and think about halliburton all-star last year you at team usa later this summer you know in all likelihood probably the all-star game in february in your hometown and those are big big deals individually for a player so what i get out with that is exposure to others i mean yeah he had the u19 experience at iowa state he played with some great great players on that team uh, you know, was a key, arguably the most important cog on an Evan Mobley and Cade Cunningham type team there. But the all-star experience from last year, and now you couple the world in the all-star game in all likelihood next year, like now he is going to be hearing those whispers. And now the question is, you know, can you, you know, create some of those whispers to your own city? And, and I, I've long believed that I think, you know, from a catalyst standpoint, he is wired in the right way. And now it's up to the Pacers to kind of continue to build you know, life with after Buddy Heald will be interesting, just given Tyrese's relationship. And, you know, I've always been an advocate for Buddy in the starting lineup. I know some people kind of push back on that. And I get defensively, you know, him and uh, Tyrese in the backcourt can, you know, offer some growing pains. But I just think his spacing is so vital and allows Tyrese to really flourish and plays to his strengths, which I don't think you can get too far away from at all. But um, certainly, you know, what next offseason looks like when you do have some money still, available you're obviously gonna be drafting a little bit later oh, oh we will get to next off season boy will we i have a lot to say about that <laughs> we, we, we'll, we'll see how they handle those two first round picks as well yep. um you know now it's okay how do you acquire i think that other kind of big ish fish and, and what does that look like for you and again i think Halliburton can be such a spearheader and all of that because i think guys just want to play with a player like him i think he is exactly what you would want as the quarterback of it all and so now it's kind of twofold. It's him continuing to prove he can be an annual all-star. And then on the Pacers end, now you've got to do your your part in further supporting him and continuing to do that when the resources aren't as abundant as they are. So I think those two things are absolutely vital to continue this marriage, you know, deep into that contract and keep it happy deep into that contract. He's got the he's got the big stuff coming up that you just said that this sometimes sounds cliche and dumb, but you can read about it right this second with Damian Lillard. Like Dame has talked about his relationship with Bam from Team USA experiences, right? Like these stars become closer through these all star and Team USA experiences. And Al Burton's a part of that. And he's a part of the Pacers for six more years. Like all of this stuff coming together matters a great deal for him and the Pacers. And so. You know, if Kevin Pritchard said this, like he believes Tyrese can be a recruiter, if that can be to Indiana, that's obviously significant for the Pacers to have this guy as long as possible. So him being a marquee guy worthy of this deal and the team being able to build with him now for a while, like it sounds like a long runway and it never really is. But like that is extremely significant. And I'll be curious, too, if, you know, that it is six years, like do you go patient at first and then push for it. Do you just push right away and try to figure it out as much as you can? Those are questions I think they can answer, you know, once this all becomes official. But that's a big part of of their next steps of this as well, because they could have a lot of space next year. We'll cut get to that in about a minute and a half. But to me, the biggest reason this is significant, and I didn't I didn't think there was ever a chance they would lose him, even in restricted free agency next year. But just you know, the Nuggets just did this. Like 
when you get your really good identity setter, it makes it so much easier to get guys who fit that like every step of the way. You're not guessing at good fits. And you just saw that in this free agency period. Like Bruce Brown is awesome in transition and is a great point of attack defender and does a lot of the stuff the Pacers do well around Tyrese Halbert. And hey, they get Obi Toppin and Tyrese Halbert during the moratorium's like, I'm going to tweet about this anyway. I'm going to throw off to this kid the second he joins the team. It's like they're already trying to find fits for that identity and style that they have. And I think that's a lot easier when you know you have a guy as long as they potentially do. So it just makes things easier. It makes building around a guy easier. And I think, it, of course, it's good work to get your good players locked up, but just get it over with. Know that your next era is kind of underway. And now it's about building around him, which I think is fascinating. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Last year, I was trying to figure out where I wanted to do in my life and where I wanted to go. I felt uncertain about the current direction I was headed. And sometimes in life, we're faced with those tough choices. And the path forward isn't always clear. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while navigating life. So you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. Therapy can be helpful for people who need to learn positive coping skills or set boundaries or just empowering you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just for those who've experienced major trauma. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. And that brings me to my next point of the Pacers giving themselves quite the chance, Kevin, because I don't know if you know this, but uh, Bruce, you do know this. I'm being a facetious, but uh, <laughs> Bruce Brown is a team option and Obi Toppin is a free agent next year. And uh, Daniel Tice could be a free agent next year. And Buddy Heald's a free agent next year. And TJ McConnell is not fully guaranteed next year. And Aaron Neesmith is a free agent next year. And Jordan Wara is a free agent next year. And Jalen Smith has a player option next year. That's a lot of names, right? Just the guys with guaranteed deals next year, $87 million plus $5 million partial guarantee for McConnell, plus Smith's player option. That's $98 million combined. The Pacers could have over $50 million in space next year. And I think that has been an under-discussed point for me and a lot of people about their offseason is, not only did they lock up Tyrese, even including his money for next year, they have set themselves up to use some of those assets you've talked about or make a splash. And I think that is significant now that you have this really talented superstar player recruiter type on your team. Yeah, you know, I tweeted out, I guess, the day of the Bruce Brown news, and I probably should have put it as bullet point number one, but I thought it was too much of a disservice to Brown as a player to, to do it. But when I saw everything, you know, who the player was, the amount of money, the length of the contract, you know, all of that, that that goes into it. The length of the contract and the second year team option probably stands out to me more than anything. Like I mean, Bruce Brown's in a contract year this year. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's either right. contract year for the Pacers or, you know, it's contract year potentially for 29 other teams. And now Bruce Brown, to be fair to him, does not strike me as a guy that needs a contract year to be motivated. I, <laughs> I think he, he's wired in a way that he just doesn't need that. And, you know, watch how Michael Malone reacted at the Denver parade to, you know, get a little bit of intel Pro CP! into what they think of him, which I absolutely <laughs> love. Uh, but yeah, in, in all seriousness, Tony, I mean, you, I, I did not know the numbers were, were to that point, but I mean, would you just say 98 million? Yeah. If they, they'd have to like cut every cap hold they have and waive every non-guarantee they have to get that high, but yeah, they yeah. can have a ton of space next summer. <laughs> they yeah. Have a ton. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a huge, huge number. And again, now you're to a point now where... Before I get quoted out of out of everybody, it's going to be lower than that because they're probably going to keep some of these guys, but it could be that high. Let me be clear. All right, continue. No, um, <laughs> and that is just... that That's a huge, huge number. And obviously, it's not like Turner's on the books for the next three to five years. You know, it, it, it's not like that, that you have that aspect to where there's tons of guys on your roster that have these massive cap hits that are going deep into the, you know, later of the 2020s. So, uh, you know, to your earlier point about when do you kind of push those chips in with Halliburton will obviously be fascinating to watch, but you're still in a position where you can, you can maneuver. And that was probably another reason why I didn't want to see them do anything. You know, I was intrigued by an OG and an OB and, and some of those names, but I also was content with not doing anything because we have yet to see Halliburton and Matherin start next to each other for any substantial period of time. Like yeah. Tyrese Halliburton has been a pacer for 18 months. If that, like it, we are still in the very wow. infancy yeah. stages <laughs> of this, 
Like, let's all just let Halliburton kind of quarterback and leave. Let's see what Matherin looks like after a full off season and him being super coachable and acknowledging full well what he needs to work on. You know, obviously Turner on the floor with these guys, they've added some pieces around that. I kind of want to see it organically grow a little bit. And then obviously you're going to get to points as a franchise where maybe you do need to do something a little bit more drastic, or maybe you don't, maybe you look at it and say, okay, this is really growing. We need to go find that David West type of piece, which is obviously a notable piece, but it's not breaking the bank and, and doing anything too, too crazy for that. So I, I, I like that aspect to it. Um, and, and again, I think maybe I'm a hopeless romantic with it, but I just love how Halliburton's wired. I love his family dynamic. Um, you know, his agents and IU guy, you know, it, like he's got so much kind of Midwest familiarity with, with all of this. Um, I do think there's something really real here that you can build. And now again, it's up mostly to the Pacers to do that. But again, Tyrese to continue to be the all-star that he showed he can be last year. The true hopeless romantic would say, why trade for OG and Obi when you have 40 million in space next summer to just sign OG? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that is not, I don't know what they will or won't do, but yeah, I mean, the logic there makes sense. And I said a lot this summer, like I get why they would go for it this year if they do. But I thought patience for one more year made sense for a lot of the reasons you just laid out. Like their core guys are 23 and 21 and whatever age you feel like some of the other guys who belong in that core are. But you know, Hal, like it's crazy that Hal Burns only 23 and Matherin is only 21 and Isaiah Jackson is super young and Andrew Nemhard super young and all these guys are still ridiculously young. Like they have a lot of room to be patient for a year and really figure it out if they want to. Granted, they also have the other pressure points you said earlier of. Haven't won a playoff game since the LeBron series. Haven't won a series since Paul George was on the team. Like that matters too. So going for it would have made sense. But I think at the age of their team, a little slower build does make sense. So allowing yourself to have a year to kind of see some of those chips fall into place, figure out what you need, all that kind of stuff. And maybe Bruce Brown and Obi Toppin are awesome and you're ready to go. Then great. You can keep both of them. It wouldn't be very hard to do. But they have a lot of ways they can go with it. And that's why I think the flexibility route that they have chosen is kind of the perfect balance between those two. And I have talked about this a lot too, of, you know, if you commit a ton of money to Halliburton, that's kind of your team, you're kind of set, but they did a good job of avoiding that with some of these shorter deals and not committing anything like Turner's deal only being two years and he becomes a free agent, the TV deal year and all these other guys doing a lot of the similar strategy. Like in the end, that could benefit the Pacers significantly if they can use their space in a meaningful way next summer that they have, the only guys they have like super long-term under contract are like Halbert and guys on rookie scale deals. So I know they use the word optionality almost so much that it's funny now, but it, it is true in this case that that long-term play paid off or they have no one expensive. They have no one under contract outside of Halbert for like a ridiculously long time. And that feels very intentional. Now the way it's all kind of lined up for them to be able to spend next summer or even maybe the summer after, depending on a few factors, despite having Hal Burns' big number on the books because of the way they've strategized all that, which I think is really smart and bodes for another uh, fun summer of talking about the big game hunting next year, I believe. <laughs> yeah, and and again, I, I don't want to fall too much into the Team USA stuff, but the Lillard-Bam analogy that you brought up earlier I think is is – great one to to bring up and i know that this team team usa roster isn't necessarily like absolutely loaded like a a dream team type of team usa but honestly that might be probably benefits the pacers a little bit more because it's guys a little bit more realistically in their radar or you know certainly on the time frames that halliburton is on as well so i just think that adds to it and, and i guess w one other thing i wanted to mention tony and this goes back to bruce brown and ob Toppin from earlier you know I guess it would have been poi. Seems like a handful of drafts ago at this point. It doesn't. It, I, I don't think it was that long, but it seems like it might be. You know, when they drafted Cassius Stanley out of Duke, I'll never forget Chad Buchanan hopping on. I, I think it was Zoom Life with us at that point. Maybe it was the COVID draft and saying, you know, we by NBA standards, the Pacers are not a very athletic basketball team, and I think moves like Brown, moves like Toppin, get you to complement guys that aren't overly athletic. And again, I mean, Halliburton and Buddy Heald are incredibly skilled in other avenues, but no one's going to sit here and act like they are the most athletic point guard or shooting guard combo in the league by any means. So more versatile, more athletic, put those types of guys around such a quarterback and such a great decision maker. And, you know, by all accounts, I think Jairus Walker fits that as a potential guy that makes the right decisions and boom, you can double Halliburton. He's a guy that's going to make 
make the right play, things like that. Um, continue to add more of those guys I think is really important as you grow, try to climb higher in the East, and then obviously at some point you're going to be knocking on that door, and that's when you move more of those chips into the middle of the table. I'll never forget Rick Carlisle saying, we're not going to be last in dunks anymore, right? From that right. point on, I felt like it was very obvious that they knew they needed that extra element above the rim, and they certainly have it now I'm looking for. I just we got to watch Isaiah Jackson the last couple of days at practice, and it's like I get why he he it's hard to get him on the floor a lot, but golly, that dude can do stuff that I'm just like, how did he do that? Like I I can see him do it, and I still don't know how. It's ridiculous. Yeah, um, I saw the highlight the Pacers put out earlier of the lob from Matherin to to him, and we had Gennaro Pargo on our show earlier today, the the summer league coach for the Pacers, and you know, asked him about Jackson, and not to get off on a tangent, but you, know, you talk about a critical third year. For yeah. him, yeah, he's certainly a guy that I'm eager to watch here over the next week or so. Yeah, you know the other part of that clip that uh, is very intriguing to me? How about Matherin throwing a lob? <laughs> certainly. <laughs> passing for him this year would be uh, quite the significant development in his insertion. This is probably my, my my dad analogy coming out, but I, I picture Matherin like, taking the two-year-old into the fine china store of like, <laughs> hey, we need to buy something for, for mom here. Don't touch anything. Matherin is like, he, he was a two-year-old last year of like, you have to watch him at all times. Like, don't touch that. Don't, you know, and again, he can score at will and he can get to the foul line. It was incredible rookie numbers. Now I want to see like a five-year-old out of him. Okay. Now, now we're okay. I don't need to watch you at all times. And that next game last year, final game of the season, he had his career high in assists. So maybe that was finally, uh, finally the time period that he, that he needed to realize that. I just broke a snow globe at a gift shop like less than a month ago. So this, <laughs> anal this analogy is sitting very close to home. <laughs> I had to go <laughs> tell the employee. Oh, the it was mortifying. I can't believe you <laughs> this. Um, so, yes, hopefully you are right. I like that analogy. That's a good way of putting it. And, hey, in a year from now, perhaps we're talking about uh, Pascal Siakam's of the world, the OG Ananobis of the world. Once again, apparently these names will never escape the Pacers ethos. <laughs> Uh, one more thing I want to talk about, which is the opposite of what I just said, and that is the long-term potential outlooks of keeping guys like Bruce Brown and Obi Toppin. What would you want to see? I'll start with Obi because he's younger, especially because he plays the same position as Jarris Walker. I'm fascinated by what he can do this year. What would you need to see from him to feel really good about? Like, obviously, you could commit to anybody as a backup, but like, what would make you feel really good about committing to Obi Toppin beyond this year if you're in charge of the Pacers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I could quickly go to the three-point shot. Just, yeah. you know, I brought up the the numbers as a starter of north of 40%. I want to say last year it was like 34 overall. You know, certainly if that could get to the, you know, high part of the 30s, you would like that. Um, but, you know, I also think just consistent playing time, what does that lead to? You know, does, does 22, 24 minutes mean that he turns into a guy that, you know, he's consistently a double figure guy and brings some nice efficiency. And I know defense and rebounding maybe isn't a, a, a strength of his, but you know, do you see a little more of that? And does that wake up in a contract year? Now, of course, you would run into the issue of, OK, now you're paying him. What does that lead to? Um, but that's a really good point you bring up, Tony, about him and Jairus Walker, you know, because it seems like in the reverse of that, that's kind of what New York is, is saying here of, of we have Julius Randle. We don't have those those minutes. But I go back to the to the athleticism thing. And I just think that's so vital for this team to have. And certainly you can't be all your chips into the shooting basket or all your chips in the athleticism basket. You have to have a little bit of mix of both, but I would say consistency with that jumper a little bit more on the defensive rebounding side of things. If he shows you that, I would certainly look into it, but you know, I don't want to lose sight to your point of, you know, wanting to stunt Jairus Walker's growth, but in a way, I think they're two very different players in what they bring and, and how you consider them kind of strength wise. So um, I'll be in, intrigued to see how the Pacers play with each of them on the floor. Honestly, kind of opposites uh, right now, at least obviously growth could be coming for either player. They're both still young. It'll be fun to track the parallels of two eighth overall pick power forwards, but you know, Obi's the offense guy and Jairus is the defense guy. And like, how do you distribute their minutes this year? So to me, there's two big things. One is Obi's defense. If he can defend at all, he's a guy worth having. Because if you can play on both ends, like, yeah, you try to keep that around and figure out what he can be. And that has not been a thing for him yet. Like, quite frankly, that's been his biggest weakness is like he is really bouncy and can do stuff around the basket. But 
you know, his foot speed's not amazing when he's away from the rim. It's not as great. And so that's something he'll have to, to show this year for a team that has totally been awful on that end of the floor the last couple of years, right? If you're not awesome at that, it's going to be hard to really blow away expectations, even if your offense is fantastic. Although I mentioned this a couple of days ago, shout out to Tom Lewis for getting this point to me. It's like his minutes and his stats are almost so misleading because it's like a 30 point game where he plays 35 minutes and then he plays six minutes and scores two points. It's like, yeah, that averages to like normal stats, but like that's not a way to develop or grow as a player. So even just consistent minutes could change what he actually looks like. But yeah, the three is another thing to me. And that goes beyond just what he can do in his stats, because if he can shoot it, I would be confident he could play with Jarris a little bit, like five mm. minutes, like a four or five punch or a three or four punch just for a little bit every game. And then you feel really good about having both in terms of what you can do from a flexibility perspective or a team building perspective around them. And obviously they have a ton of young fives already, but that would just add a lot of elements to them. And I'm not saying he's a one year rental or anything. He could be very good this year, or he could just be a, a great backup pickup. And again, I like the price they paid for him. I'm just very curious what it would take for him to really establish himself as a long-term pace this year. Cause they just drafted a guy at the exact same position who fits very well also. Yeah, and, you know, to go kind of back off Tom's point to you, you know, if you look at top and starting moments, so much of that is like early April. Yeah. You're just yeah. Like, okay, you know, who who is he facing off in those right. games? You know, the thing that stood out to me, again, you know, both those Pacers games, he did have a high volume of threes in that game. And, I mean, to me, that just seems like that's stuff you can't really fluke. You know, it, 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 if you dominate a bunch of guys inside the paint in early April, that can be a little fluky. I mean, if you're consistently over 40% from three – and again, the volume, if I'm not mistaken, was like over five attempts a game. I'll check yeah, while you're that, talking. That is, that is hard to do. So um, we'll see how all that plays out. I'm with you on all that. And I want to check his splits as a starter now because you got me. You got me intrigued. <laughs> uh, he started less than I thought last year. So never mind. This is, uh, he had no starts as a rookie. I remember that. Uh, yeah, 44.4% as a starter from three last year. Pretty good. And then, and then do, they have, do they have the amount of attempts there? Oh, yeah, I scrolled up. Uh, that would be on 36 attempts, in, uh, so a little over seven a game. That was last year alone. It's not his whole career. Right. So I think Still average, good. you know, it, it kind of breaks down to around five, which, you know, is is a really high number. And, you know, look yeah, at times right last on. week that Jalen Smith was out on the floor as the four. I mean, that was a big issue for you. It's right. probably a big reason why Isaiah Jackson has never sniffed minutes alongside Miles, you know, things like that. So same general question for Bruce Brown. This is a little different because they have the team option instead of free agency. And you know, there's just more factors at play with him. But if he's if he's good, you just keep him next year. Like obviously, I think that discussion is is fairly simple. But even beyond that, what would it take for him to kind of stick as a very long-term piece for this team to you? Because to me, he fills the perfect box as that point of attack defender they've needed. Like if he's really good at that and that boosts the lineup he's in, that's kind of all I would need to see if I'm the Pacers. Yeah, I, I probably don't need to see much more than the, he's just kind of blossomed into. I mean, as long yeah. as he can check those boxes, I think they are they are such boxes, boxes of current weakness that it, it's just so valuable to keep him around. And again, he strikes me as a dude that, you know, this is a former five-star recruit. I mean, this was a really talented kid going to Miami. So you know there's a lot more in there than just second-round label who's bounced around to, you know, four teams in however many years that he's been in the league. So – you know he's got something in there, um, and you know whether it's the to your point that 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 on ball defense, the versatility, and obviously winning. Um, and he's a guy that I thought his game kind of rose in the playoffs as well. I mean, it's not like he For sure. was a whatever twelve point score off the bench and it fell down to eight in the playoffs because his minutes shrunk or something like that. He was great for them and particularly really good in the final. So I brought up the whole length of the contract earlier, just to point out that it gives the Pacers options, but I am, I'd be stunned if all of a sudden Bruce Brown struggled to the point where you wouldn't pick up that team option. And, and again, he seems like a guy given his age and, and given how he's wired and, and the playoff success. And again, the defensive end of the floor and all of that of, yeah, this is a guy that you want to look into, you know, for whatever, three to four years after that, um, you know, obviously a lot of people with pushback have pointed out the, the surplus of guards and forwards, you know, this is not what I would have said about the Pacers three or four years ago, Tony, but there used to be a certain, well, right now you can argue there's a surplus of center. They used to have a surplus of centers and point guards. 
In today's NBA, if you're going to have a surplus anywhere, have it be on the guards and wings and forwards. And I get Bruce Brown's 6'4", six, 6'9", six, wingspan, I think makes him a little bigger than that. But if you're going to have an abundance anywhere, have it there and let Rick Carlisle, you know, show why he makes whatever he makes on an annual basis to figure it all out. I'm with you there. I think that, especially because this sounds silly, but you know, even if you're sticker shocked by his value, the fact that it's so high means that not an early bird rights could be enough to keep him in free agency, like fairly easily. So like they it's have cool. a lot of easy means to keep him beyond their own team control already. And so if he does come in and looks like the player was last year and checks all these boxes, I think it's very easy to imagine them keeping him for as long as he's still productive and a good fit with their team. And I'm kind of uh, look, I think they have too many two threes still like in theory, one player who sure. probably should play won't if their roster doesn't change. But I'm kind of over, like, I've said it a lot, so this is a shot at myself. I'm kind of over saying two threes. I'm just going to say wings from now on. If you're not Tyrese Halliburton, you're playing wing, right? Like, you're not a guard. <laughs> you're not, you're not dribbling that much. I don't know. It yeah. doesn't matter. They all do similar roles. Kevin, this was great. Um, I'll be curious if the Pacers do anything else in this free agency period. It feels like the whole league's kind of waiting on those two uh, all-star guards to figure out what's going on here. So, uh, Pacers maybe are done, maybe not. I don't really know. We'll see. But thank you very much for the time talking about everything that's happened so far you bet man safe travels out to vegas outstanding coverage per usual over the last few weeks and month or so and uh, looking forward to all your coverage from out there man thanks for having me of course we'll see what happens if there is a transaction the next day or two we'll cover it here if not summer league preview coming tomorrow looking forward to breaking down what the pacers will look like out in vegas thank you everybody for listening see you soon